Today on Day of Discovery, In His Footsteps with Jim Cantillon. This child is going to be a light to the nations and to the glory of Israel, but mm. there will be division. It, he will be for the right, fall and rising of many in Israel. With God, anything is possible, but without God's intervention here, it's not going to happen. So what you have here is a supernatural event. Welcome to In His Footsteps with Dave Discovery. I'm Jim Catalan. We have a great uh, half hour ahead of us here. We're going to be looking at Mary. Is there any woman more loved and more famous in history than Mary, the mother of Jesus? She was just a young girl, and we'll be discovering in the scripture just how young she was, and also what a remarkable awareness she had of her father who is in heaven. Even right from the beginning, I just want to say this. Her very life was predicated on magnifying the Lord. And when we get to her song in a few minutes, we'll see how critical that was. But right off the top, friends, here's a lesson for life. You focus on the Lord, not on yourself, you're going to spiritually grow. Coming along to help me is Dr. Claire Fawn. She is not only the co-developer of the Nazareth Village, but she also is a professor and very, very effective historian, great communicator, and a good friend of mine. So you've got a great half hour ahead. Don't miss a moment of it. We'll be back with the teaching right after this. And now we return to In His Footsteps with Jim Cantillon on Day of Discovery. Here we are in Nazareth Village, which is a marvelous recreation of what it might have looked like and been in Jesus' time. We're in the upper story here of Mary's house. Can you believe it? And there's lots of action around. There are tour groups. There's a children's group just beyond my shoulder here. It's just a real active place. Now, Mary. I want to read from the scripture first before I comment on her. This is from Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Hello, Nazareth. To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. <laughs> and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. When she saw him, she was troubled. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I'd be on the floor in fear. She was troubled and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, will be called the son of the highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now, Mary's speechless, obviously, gasping maybe at what she just heard, but she has whatever it takes to say, but how can this be? since I do not know a man. In other words, I haven't slept with a man. I'm a virgin. The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also, that Holy One who is to be, who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, this is an amazing story. We, we all know how amazing this is. And if there is one sticking point for a lot of scholars, let alone everyday uh, people out there, it's this business of a virgin giving birth how does that happen? Well, it doesn't happen. That's the point. With God, anything is possible, but without God's intervention here, it's not going to happen. So what you have here is a supernatural event. This is a conception that goes beyond the bounds of anything mankind has ever known in history. And it's an angelic visitation to, to introduce to this young girl. By the way, we don't know exactly, but she probably was just 15 or 16 years of age. She was just a young girl. Gabriel is the angel, and the first thing I notice here is he says, the Lord is with you. What does that mean? It means that the Lord had taken note of Mary right from day one. He knew her before she was born in her mother's womb. I mean, this was something very, very special, and the Lord had planned something for her from day one. Mary's troubled at these words. Who wouldn't be? Troubled is a euphemism. Uh, there are those of us who would panic. Some of us would pass out. I mean, what's going on here? But she says, you have found favor with God, and you're going to give birth to Messiah. Now, I need to comment on this. We have what's called 
400 years of silence. After the last prophet prophesied in the Old Testament, there was about 400 years of prophetic silence. It seemed as though God had just walked away. And yet, throughout the course of those 400 years, there was always an undercurrent on the part of a small group of people of expectation that the promised king of Israel would come. The anointed one, that's what Messiah means, the anointed one would come. And so there was this growing group over those 400 years who had a tradition of meeting together, praying together, asking God Most High to bring the mighty king to rule over his people Israel. This is what's called by theologians the messianic hope. Now, of course, the ultimate for these small groups of people was that one of their own, one of their own daughters would be the one who would bear this Messiah. And this, of course, you know, went beyond uh, hope. It was, it was like a fantasy almost. And yet there were many young girls who cherished this hope in their hearts. And so Mary was one of these, and she was something else. Uh, she obviously had a pure heart. She was um, devout. Uh, she was probably literate, uh, probably was aware of the scripture, probably was aware of the um, uh, prophetic announcements that have been made over the years. You have to believe this because in response to this message, she goes to visit her aunt Elizabeth in Ankarim, which is a suburb of Jerusalem. There's a marvelous interaction between the, two, between the two of them. And then Mary utters this beautiful song. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit has rejoiced in God, my savior. I mean, this is poetry, friends. You don't expect this from someone who's illiterate. This, this is a, a literate girl who has profound spiritual insight. He has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant for behold, henceforth, all generations will call me blessed. And isn't that true? to this very day. For he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. I mean, how would this 15, 16 year old have that theological concept? She understood this. Obviously she was trained in the scriptures. His mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones, exalted the lowly, filled the hungry with good things. The rich he has sent away empty. Here she is reflecting on the profound social justice message of the Old Testament prophets. You know, the prophets of Israel called the people of Israel to two things, to right relationship with God and right relationship with neighbor. And in the Hebrew language, right relationship with God and right relationship with neighbor was often the same word, zadkah or zedek. Basically, it meant fulfill the relationship with God, fulfill the relationship with neighbor. Righteousness, justice. And justice meant caring for the poor. Uh, justice meant going for the orphan, the widow, the alien, for those who had no power, no influence. All right? Mary understood this. I mean, this, this is profound from such a young, young girl. Um, he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. And then we read, Mary stayed with Elizabeth for, for three months and then returned to her house. And it's after this that Joseph, you know, takes care of her and uh, eventually takes her down to Bethlehem for the census. And we'll be talking about that in future programs. Just a few things to learn from Mary, friends. Number one is sensitivity to the voice of God. You know, people sometimes say to me, well, how do I know the voice of God? Well, the voice of God can come in many ways. But the number one way he comes is through his word. You know, my daily bread. That's how he comes to us. And that's what she had access to. She obviously was a synagogue attender. She was there when the Old Testament scriptures were being read faithfully every Shabbat. And she obviously was doing some study on her own. That's where the ultimate word of God comes to us is through his word. But then there are other ways the Lord speaks to us. Sometimes it's through a, a powerful sense of conviction that one should do something or say something. And you can say, well, that's just, you know, your natural inclination. If it's something that goes beyond natural inclination, that is persistent, that moves you in a kind of a convicting way to finally do or say something, you know that's the voice of God to you. Other times, the Lord can speak to you just in a flash, a moment of insight, when suddenly it occurs to you, you know what, I believe the Lord is calling me to be a teacher, or calling me to be a lawyer, or calling me to be a pastor. 
you have this sense in your heart that God is identifying you with a very special calling. This is how the Lord speaks to you. Uh, and there's other ways, of course. It's very seldom it's an audible voice, although I have known people who tell me they have heard the Lord speak to them audibly. I never have. But here's the thing. The place you start is here. And Mary obviously had a grounding in the Word of God. And this is a powerful example to you and me. And even as I sit here in Mary's house, I'm reminded of the integrity that her knowledge of God brought to her character. In a few minutes, we'll be getting back to Dr. Claire Fawn, who is co-creator of the Nazareth Village. She's a fascinating person, a great teacher. You don't want to miss it. And now we return to In His Footsteps with Jim Cantillon on Day of Discovery. Claire, do you, is there any chance that uh, Joseph may have been a widower? Yes, you know, the, the historic view, both in the Catholic Church, so the Church of the West, and in the Orthodox world, is that Joseph was a widower with children from his previous marriage, whose wife had died. And we realize when we read in the Gospels the names of Jesus' brothers and sisters, there are at least four brothers and two sisters, plus Jesus. So the household that Jesus grew up in was a lively household. It wasn't just Joseph, Mary, and Jesus, right. but it was 10 people easily. So the, the suggestion is that he was a widower, quite older than she was, and that he passed away probably in Jesus' teens. Now, I, I've noticed uh, in the few times I've been in the Louvre in Paris, occasionally there are family pictures that artists have depicted of Jesus and Mary and Joseph. And there's this uh, young taller guy in the picture too. Who is that? Yes, yeah, so especially in the Orthodox art, we see this. The taller young man is James, the brother of Jesus, who becomes the head of the Jerusalem church. We read about him in the yeah. epistle to the Galatians. We read about him in the Acts of the Apostles in Acts 15 and Acts 21. He came to prominence and, and it's an interesting thing because um, we get that sense that during part of Jesus's ministry, his mother and his brothers were worried that he was going off the deep end and they tried to kind of draw him back and say, calm down and everything. And um, James is part of that crowd, but he, although he has that skepticism, also we see it in John chapter seven, when they're gonna go up to the Feast right. of Tabernacles and they say, why don't you go now and show that you're the Messiah? Yeah. So there's skepticism. But the thing that I find so interesting is that when Paul tells us the people who had resurrection appearances of Jesus, we know, of course, Peter, etc., and James, James had a personal resurrection appearance from Jesus, which leads me to believe that he shifted his perspective during Jesus's ministry, just as his mother must have, because if Mary is at the cross, it means Mary traveled from the Galilee yeah. with Jesus, the disciples, both men and women, in a long journey that takes weeks to come up to Jerusalem, that she's there at the triumphal entry, she's present when they have the Last Supper. She's present at the cross and she's part of the resurrection community. I assume that James also was there and that he just, it isn't mentioned in our four canonical gospels, but the hint we get from Paul's epistle that he had a resurrection appearance of Jesus mm. and then he becomes the head of the Jerusalem church is pretty stunning. Let's talk about Mary, the, the young woman for a few minutes. Uh, when she had this angelic visitation, Gabriel, announcing to her that she was going to bear a son and was to call his name Jesus. How old would she have been, do you think? Yes, I mean, when we look at, at marriage practices in first century Jewish life, a girl would be, get, be betrothed between the ages of 15 and 16, perhaps, and right. be married by 18. Yeah. So we have to think that she's just mid-teens. She's not 20s or 30s. If a woman got to be 20 and she wasn't married, you would say, you know, what is the problem with her or with the family? People would be already married. Is there any reference at all in the scripture to her lineage? You know, the importance that uh, Jewish culture placed on pedigree. Uh, any any uh, indication that she may have come from the line of David, for instance? Yes, I think that both genealogies in Matthew and Luke speak of the family coming from the line of David. Uh, and that's very important from a messianic perspective. I've also heard it said that it may be that Mary came from a family that had Levitical um, DNA. Yes. You think so? We don't know for sure. I mean, it, they could, have, of course, have DNA from both particular tribes, Judah, 
the mm -hmm. Davidic tribe and Levi, because if she's related to Elizabeth, who is married to Zacharias, a priest, right. so that has to come from the tribe of Levi. And so we want to say, what is the connecting point between Elizabeth and Mary in terms of familial relations, and is there Levitical blood on that side as well? When she goes and visits uh, her aunt Elisheva, Elizabeth, and yeah, Ankaram, um, the uh, uh, John the Baptist was just in uh, Elizabeth's womb, and the scripture says that uh, this little embryo leaped in yes. the presence of uh, the also pregnant Mary when she came into the room, which I find fascinating. Mm -hmm. But um, do you think that? Elizabeth, Zacharias, maybe Mary's family, and others may have been a part of a, a grouping who had some kind of, um, they kept the messianic fires burning. Uh, it, it, it seems to me it would have been in Congress for the Lord to speak to someone who had no messianic inclination or expectation or a worldview. Yes, I think Luke, when he presents us with the story of Zechariah and Elisheva, yeah, Elizabeth, yeah. And then with the story of Mary and Joseph, and then with the partners of Simeon and Anna, right. Luke is showing us that the pious of Israel, those who are waiting for the blessed hope, which is a very important title yeah. that he gives to Jesus in the Acts of the Apostles as well as the Gospels. Those who are waiting for the blessed hope and the fulfillment of God's promises, these pious of Israel, they recognize the fulfillment of the promise when it comes. And part of the reason Luke does this is because he wants to assure his readership that God keeps covenant, that his promises are fulfilled, and that he does not fail, and that Israel recognized the coming of the Messiah. The infancy narrative of Luke, chapters 1 and chapters 2, are, are full of joy and rejoicing and promise fulfilled. And this is very important for Luke's readers because most of them are Gentiles and they're the new kids on the block. And they would look at their own era and say, why aren't more Jews believing that Jesus is the Messiah? And if God, has God failed the Jews, will he fail us? So Luke makes it a point by taking these characters and showing us God's miraculous action in their lives and the fulfillment of the promises that the Gentiles, too, can trust God for his promises to be fulfilled. Claire, every time I read what we know as Mary's Magnificat, mm -hmm. my soul doth magnify the Lord. Uh, I'm, I'm inspired. Mm -hmm. uh, the poetry is profound. The um, expressions of the nature of God and praise for his mercy and for his sovereignty is absolutely just profound. And I, I, I sometimes wonder at this. Do you suppose this was a hymn that she had memorized? Or do you think this came spontaneously, not just from her heart, but from her background, her education, maybe her upbringing in a Levitical household? Yes, and I think that um, familiarity with, for example, the story of Hannah and her prayer of praise, and with the Psalms, those things, you know, had a deep and rich planting in her heart. So when she utters her Magnificat, which really focuses on the fact that she who is a nothing, she's a teenage girl, she has no status, yeah. she's not going to be a priest, she is not going to be a teacher, she is from a backwater town of Nazareth, it's not a backwater in a bad sense, yeah. but she's not from Jerusalem or yeah. Bethlehem, which are the important places. And yet God has chosen for her to be the mother of the Messiah. He exalts the lowly. He shows favor to the humble. This is her personal testimony, and it confounds the wisdom of men. But I think the words are all just, you know, echoes of a deep deposit of scripture in her life. When she and Joseph bring the baby Jesus, to be presented in the temple, Simeon and Anna. Simeon, an old prophet, now letteth thy servant depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. 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 I, I have a, a <laughs> even now, a hard time with that. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a culmination of a life spent in expectation. Yes. And how he could see it in that baby is beyond me. It must have been a special revelation from the Holy Spirit. I think it was definitely a Holy Spirit moment. 
And yet even in his recognition that this is the child, it leads to a spirit of prophecy in him because yeah. then he tells Mary, well, this child is going to be a light to the nations and to the glory of Israel, but mm. there will be division. It, he will be for the right, fall and rising of many in Israel, and a sword will also pierce your heart, which means that a sword is going to pierce him. Yeah. That there will be tragedy, but the big picture is that even the Gentiles will be touched by this life. So it's as though in his prophecy at the beginning of the gospel, you anticipate the end. The reader is prepared that there will be opposition, that there will be violence, but that at the end of this, God's purpose is to reach all humanity will be fulfilled. It's absolutely astonishing. You know, friends, uh, I really mean this. This Simeon Anna thing in the, in, in the temple, um, I, I, I have a visceral reaction to it. Every, every uh, Christmas morning when, when I had uh, our three kids at home with us, I would read this to them. I would read the, you know, the Luke story, mm -hmm. and then I would finish off with Simeon, uh, now live thy servant mm -hmm. departed peace. I, I, I think that <clears throat> every one of us has something deep in, in here that responds to the real deal. Not to, you know, religious coercion or arm twisting from those who appear to be spiritual, but something that responds deep, viscerally to the voice and the presence of God. And we may not be Simeon, but if there's something in you that says yes to Jesus, I'd say trust it. After this break, I'll conclude the show. And now we return to In His Footsteps with Jim Cantillon on Day of Discovery. You know, sometimes, friends, people um, diminish men and women of faith by saying, well, you know what? It's a comfort to them, and they're in it for what's in it for them. And they talk about, you know, the testimonial perhaps a friend has given about how the Lord delivered them from some kind of compulsive behavior, some kind of bad habit, whatever. And that's all legitimate. But you know what? There is more to this business of love for God than just simply for what's in it for me. Mary is a great example. Even as a teenager, the very first words out of her mouth were, my soul magnifies the Lord. What Mary had was a high view of God. When you have a high view of God, everything else falls into place. When you have a high view of God, you see him as the creator. When you have a high view of God, you see him as Lord of all. When you have a high view of God, you see yourself as accountable to him because he's the one that's made you. A high view of God is really the North Star to guide you throughout the course of your life. There's no question at all, friends, that he does a lot for us, absolutely. But what he really wants us to do is to glorify him for who he is, to remember him every day, to be grateful to him every day, and to see one's life as defined in terms of a loving relationship full of accountability and fellowship. This is what I see in Mary. And I have taken her example to heart, and I try to apply that example every day. And I know that if you try to do the same, you will do the same. And as you glorify the Lord, guess what? The Lord will make your path straight. Thanks for watching and we'll see you again next time. Bye for now. Join us again next week at this same time for another Day of Discovery. Day of Discovery is a video outreach of Our Daily Bread Ministries Canada and is supported by the free will gifts of friends like you who enjoy these programs. For more information about Our Daily Bread Ministries Canada, please visit us online at ourdailybread.ca.